Thank you everyone for, for joining us. Welcome to the California Thoracic Society Friday evening educational webinar. Tonight's presentation is titled Airway Clearance and Bronchiectasis and Neuromuscular Disease. Our speaker that we're delighted to have is Dr. Megan Marmer. So Dr. Marmer is Clinical Assistant Professor of Medicine in the Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care Division in the School of Medicine at Stanford University, Stanford Healthcare. She's a specialist in the treatment of individuals with chronic airways disease, bronchiectasis, and chronic lung infections. And again, Dr. Marmer, we're delighted to have you. Um, this webinar series has been developed by the California Thoracic Society in collaboration with Electromed Incorporated, maker of the Smart Vest. Thank you so much for your support, Electromed. Uh, there will be an opportunity uh, for live questions and answers at the end of this webinar. So please use the Zoom uh, Q&A functionality for your questions. Uh, you're all very welcome to submit questions during the webinar, and we will do our best to answer all of those questions at the end of Dr. Marmer's presentation. So without further ado, again, thank you all for joining. Uh, very, very pleased to introduce Dr. Megan Marmer. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. I'll assume everyone can hear me unless I hear otherwise. Um, so as Dr. Sue mentioned, I'm going to speak over the next 30 minutes about airway clearance strategies in bronchiectasis and or neuromuscular disease. And as Dr. Sue mentioned, I'm a pulmonologist by training um, with a focus on bronchiectasis. So I actually wanna thank Dr. Michelle Cow and Susan Metcalf from Respiratory Therapy for sharing some of their expertise in the care of patients with neuromuscular disease in preparation for this talk. I have nothing to disclose. So let's start by discussing some of the innate mechanisms for um, airway defense. So at the very microscopic level, we have the ciliated epithelium that includes these charged mucopolysaccharides on the edge of the, of the cilia that create almost like the bristles of a brush. And those bristles, coax mucin polymers released by the neighboring uh, goblet cell up into this mobile gel layer that is then swept continuously both medially and rostrally throughout the day to help us clear pollutants or um, invaders into our lungs. And so when we think about the vicious cycle or, or hypothesis for the development of bronchiectasis in the susceptible host, there is some sort of initial injury that say it's an infection that summons neutrophils to that site of injury. And those neutrophils come with really good intentions. They come to clean up that infection or chemical injury, but in the midst of its cleanup, it can also end up destroying a lot of that ciliated epithelium. Um, it release, those neutrophils also release a number of chemokines and cytokines that trigger the production of numerous mucin genes that are turned on almost in a semi-permanent way and can be very difficult to turn off. So at the end of that infection, you're left with an airway that has some denuded epithelium, goblet cells that are stimulated to generate more mucus than they did before. And in some cases, there are more goblet cells than were originally present. And you have now a dilated boggy airway where um, it easily collapses under the positive pressure of a cough and traps secretions now back behind that region. And it, it's no longer participating in that healthy mobile gel. And then on the macro level, our cough mechanism, all of us have coughed at some point today through a very coordinated um, interaction of afferent, efferent nerves and the muscles of our chest and abdominal wall. And so when we feel the trigger to cough, our vagal nerve will open our glottis. We take a large breath in. The glottis then closes and then our C-spine, everywhere from C-spine C3 at the phrenic nerve down to T12 L1 triggers muscles throughout the chest wall, abdominal wall, and diaphragm to contract down against a closed glottis, creating a transglottic pressure often well in excess of 100 millimeters of mercury. And then within less than a second, the glottis opens and you have this expulsive force that allows you to clear your airway. 
So you can imagine an injury to any one of these nerves impairing the ability to generate a, a reasonable transglottic pressure that allows you to clear your secretions. So I think it's important that we, we talk about, you know, when we, when we talk about patients with bronchiectasis, with various neuromuscular disease, airway clearance is often thought to be this important pillar of care where we should be telling and counseling our patients, we really need you to do your airway clearance diligently and religiously. But I think it's important that we're humbled by the fact that a lot of that recommendation for airway clearance is, is based on grade D level of evidence where the effect size is really not known and is often based on expert opinion. As I was preparing this talk and going through the various studies of different airway clearance modalities, most of them are very small with an N somewhere between five to 20 patients. Um, they're often single center. And many of them were very short interval crossover studies with a short washout period. What do I mean by that? So there was one of eight patients who used flutter valve for three days, followed by switching to postural drainage for three days. When you use a modality for three days, can we really fully appreciate its effect size, be it a benefit or a harm? And then when we have someone switch quickly to another modality, if they feel great on day four when they switch to postural drainage, what's to say that wasn't the effect of using the flutter valve for the three days prior? So it's really hard to, to know what the effect size is. Keep in mind, all of these studies also used different outcomes. So some would look at changes in the patient's peak cough flow. Others would look at changes or differences in their sputum weight. So it then makes it more difficult to do things like meta-analysis, where you try to then compare some of these different modalities against each other from different studies. Um, and then I think from a clinical perspective, we know that our patients with neuromuscular disease and bronchiectasis, no two are the same, and that their needs are unique, and that we have to really tailor their therapy to their needs. Who should we be thinking about airway clearance for? So I would say any patient with, and this is rooted in guidelines, suggesting that we should be using airway clearance in individuals with bronchiectasis who do or some who don't have a purulent cough. Um, you know, the, I think about, say, my patients with bronchiectasis who are chronically colonized with pseudomonas, and they don't necessarily routinely expectorate any sputum. But for a person who you suspect has really dense biofilm, which, it, which Pseudomonas is notoriously good at creating, you could imagine that a modality of airway clearance that could help break up that biofilm might allow them to respond better to antibiotic treatments you might want to use for them. You might also think about it in, say, your asthma patient who develops an acute upper respiratory infection. They have a lot of secretions and they may benefit from the assistance in augmenting their cough. For the neuromuscular disease patient, when you look through the literature, there is some evidence that suggests that individuals who have a peak cough flow that sits at about 270 liters per minute or greater they're very likely to be able to generate a strong cough, even when they become sick and therefore weaker. But once you start to fall below that 270 line, they're very likely to have impaired cough force. Also individuals with a reduced maximum inspiratory pressure or an FVC less than 50. But let's imagine you're, you don't have those tools at your disposal. You're meeting this patient for the first time on the inpatient consult service. Some rules of thumb that you might wanna consider is in a neuromuscular patient who has T4 or higher paralysis is very likely not gonna be able to generate the kind of transglottic pressure using abdominal and chest wall muscles necessary to generate a good cough. And in line with, transglottic pressures, if they have bulbar weakness, they may not be able to have a good glottic seal to generate a good cough force. Maybe they have a lot of oral secretions that are difficult for them to manage. Those are other, in, other features or characteristics that might get you thinking about airway clearance. Okay, so I think 
at least from the pulmonary perspective, I think that we often think of airway clearance as a medication that our patients nebulize. Um, but I just want to draw your attention to column number three here, supporting evidence, where we see words like unclear benefit, no data, may help. Um, there is really, really weak evidence to support the use of our nebulized treatments for airway clearance. And I suspect that one day when we learn more about these medications and all the dust settles, that really the fact that these medicines are moistening the airway, softening secretions, and maybe making them just a little bit easier to cough out is where they provide the greatest benefit. So for my own clinical practice, if a medication is both well tolerated um, with no untoward side effects and offers a sensation of softened secretions that allows someone to expectorate more, then perfect, that's the right solution for them. And no one of these is necessarily superior to another. Um, I would though like to point out um, data from Ann O'Donnell's prospective trial in 1998, looking at the use of Dornay's alpha in patients with bronchiectasis who did not also have cystic fibrosis. And in that group of individuals, there was no benefit demonstrated. And in fact, there seemed to be um, a tendency towards harm with a greater amount of um, exacerbations. So that's why we do not support the use of Dornay's alpha um, in patients who do not have cystic fibrosis. So rather than thinking about airway clearance as a, a nebulized medication, I like to think of it as an activity or utilizing um, uh, devices to augment the strength of your cough. And one of my favorite modalities is what's known as active cycle of breathing or autogenic drainage. They're slightly different variations on what we colloquially know as the huff cough. Um, the basis of, of these maneuvers is one where the patient takes a large breath in, holds their breath at the top with the idea that there is there are collateral channels of ventilation within the lung. And if you can coax air through those collateral channels into a plugged airway, you can get air behind it and then create a, a gradient across the plug. The patient is then asked to do a series of controlled forceful exhalations using the muscles of the chest wall and the abdomen to almost in effect Heimlich their secretion up and out of, their, of those plugged airways. I really like this modality in that it's free. It can be done anywhere. You can pair it with other devices, say like an oscillating vest. Um, I also love that it puts the patient in the driver's seat. I think for some individuals, when they do airway clearance, it can be violent coughing fits. They feel lightheaded. Some people experience urinary incontinence. And rather than going through that, thinking of your cough as a very controlled, um, studied maneuver can be very empowering. Keep in mind, in order to do this, you need to have an a patient with a cognitive status that can participate in the activity, and you need to have a strong enough force from the abdominal um, wall and thoracic wall to generate good force to then cough. One uh, modality that I think is, is very popular are the positive expiratory pressure devices. Um, and some of these, they, well, they come in two flavors. There's ones that strictly offer positive pressure or resistance at the mouthpiece. And then there are those that also offer oscillations. Um, the positive pressure at the lip is often on the order of 10 to 20 centimeters of water. Um, and again, the patient is asked to take a large breath in, hold their breath at the top to promote collateral ventilation, and then exhale steadily and slowly using the chest wall and abdominal wall muscles to create a forceful exhalation against resistance. And the positive pressure is thought to help splint airways open to promote the movement of, of secretions in impacted airways. And oscillations are thought to help loosen secretions from the wall of the airway. There is not a lot of robust data uh, to support the use of either of um, the oscillating or non-oscillating PEP devices. 
they are very helpful in that one, they're relatively affordable. Their cost um, is generally somewhere between 50 and $100. They're portable. Um, they can also be paired with other modalities like a vest. Um, but again, you need a patient who's going to be able to get a very good mouth seal, who's going to be able to engage with the instructions of large breath, hold it at the top, strong exhalation. And then you also have to consider that these devices need to be cleaned regularly, which adds to the burden of care. So the original form of airway clearance was in the form of chest physiotherapy, which was a combination of postural drainage and then also chest wall percussion. So in postural drainage, you're utilizing the benefit of gravity to help drain secretions from diseased lung back towards the center of the chest so that the patient can cough it out. I find in clinical practice, it can be very helpful to actually show the patient over here on your body is where the majority of your lung disease sits. I would encourage you to lay down in a position with this diseased part up towards the ceiling and then do your other your other modalities of airway clearance like a huff cough, like using your flutter valve. I find that this um, postural drainage is a really easy sell in the individual who, whose cough keeps them up at night or wakes them up from sleep. I'll often encourage them an hour before bed to lay down in those triggering positions that make them give them the urge to cough and encourage them to do um, you know, some component of their airway clearance therapy to see if they can't get those secretions out early and then get a better night's rest. Um, direct chest wall percussion um, also has some very small body of evidence behind it. There is no clear duration of chest wall percussion or amount of force that's um, been studied that we think is optimal. What was striking is that in most small studies, the, the direct chest percussion was most limited by patient pain. It can actually be very uncomfortable. You can imagine if you have a lot of plur pleurisy already to begin with, it's certainly not made better by direct chest wall percussion. Um, but this modality is a really helpful one in an individual who is, say, dependent of care, who can't engage with their airway clearance on their own and needs a caregiver to really help facilitate it for them. Um, and then, but do keep in mind then you are asking a lot more of that caregiver to provide chest wall physiotherapy. And this is a technique that I would really encourage um, if a family wants to do this, that they meet one-on-one -on -one with a respiratory therapist to really be shown how to do it effectively so it's done well. Um, and then there's the high-frequency chest wall oscillating vest, which I think we all know very well. Um, and like its name uh, suggests, a patient wears a vest. It's connected to a compressor that offers high frequency oscillations on the order of five to 25 hertz. Um, and I really like this modality primarily because it has the most evidence behind it, where there are emerging studies in recent years that suggest that the use of the vest reduces exacerbations, improves a patient's sense of overall health. I think it is the very rare bird who is going to be able to put their vest on like this gentleman in the photo, put their feet up and say like, job well done. Um, I, I often say that if you're going to use the vest to almost think of it as the mechanical substitute for a respiratory therapist or family member directly percussing a patient's chest, it should be paired with elements of postural drainage with the use of your nebulizer with um, huff cough maneuvers that help mobilize those secretions centrally. Um, and I think, again, this can be a very helpful device, especially in individuals who are dependent of care, where a caregiver needs to be um, helping them through their airway clearance. Um, the caregiver can place the, the vest on the patient and then let the vest do the work. Um, and then I think the, the other limiting factor for some families is that it can have variable insurance coverage and can be quite costly. 
And then there is the intrapulmonary percussive ventilation or oscillating lung expansion um, device. Uh, you know, IPV was for a long time thought as only something that was available in hospitals, but in recent years has been more readily available for patients at home. It includes a, a compressor that offers two things. It offers continuous peep in the background on the order of five to 15 centimeters of water. And then you can either have continuous or oscillating periods of uh, uh, cyclic periods of oscillation, where you can have oscillations that go five to 25 uh, or 20 centimeters of water above PEEP um, at high frequency to help break apart secretions. And that PEEP component can also help recruit lung and maximize for collateral ventilation to get air back behind your secretion. With, um, with in line with your tubing, you also have a nebulizer system where patients can add medications like albuterol, like hypersal. And then there are numerous different uh, patient interfaces, including a mouthpiece, full face mask, it can connect to a trach. Um, and in some cases could attach in theory to an endotracheal tube, assuming the patient was safe enough um, to be disconnected from a ventilator for any period of time. Um, this can be a very helpful device for patients who need, um, who have a lot of burdensome atelectasis and need more lung recruitment, who really like the sensation of oscillation and can be really helpful in the neuromuscular disease patient. Um, some limitations is if you're, if you're uncomfortable with having something in your mouth, um, you can't create a good seal, that can be a limiting factor. And then again, sometimes um, insurance coverage can be a, a challenging issue and the cost can be uh, prohibitive for some families. As compared to VEST, the IPV system does not have as much data um, collected on it. It has some evidence for Duchenne's, it has some evidence for bronchiectasis and for patients undergoing weaning from tracheostomy. When we think about neuromuscular disease, we often think about the cough assist device or mechanical um, insufflation exufflation. You have a compressor device with a patient interface where the device can either be manually operated by a caregiver or the caregiver can simply hold it there and the device will automatically time with the patient's breath. But it offers positive pressure with a breath hold for two to three seconds anywhere from 10 up to 40 centimeters of water. And then we'll rapidly switch to negative 10 to negative 40 centimeters of water, effectively sucking secretions up and out of the patient. For individuals who have lower peak cough flows, say that theirs is less than 270, they're less than 160, this device can really augment their peak cough flow. This should have a zero behind it, apologies. Um, to what we would consider to be a relatively normal peak cough flow. A um, couple of things to consider if you're thinking of using this modality. So one, it does not offer humidity or moisture and it does not offer oscillation. The other thing to keep in mind is in individuals who have um, sialuria, they generate a lot of secretions in the mouth, or an individual who has bulbar dysfunction where the larynx is, for lack of a better term, almost uh, floppy. You could imagine that during the positive pressure stage, oral secretions could be blown down very easily. And then when you transition to the negative pressure stage in bulbar dysfunction patients, it can actually suck the larynx shut, which can be really difficult to tolerate, even scary for a patient. So it's not a absolute contraindication, but it might make you say, okay, well, if for my bulbar dysfunction patient, let me start with lower settings, slowly titrate up. And if their feedback to you is, man, I'm really having a hard time tolerating this, or I can't produce anything with it, you may wanna to move towards an IPV type system instead where there's um, not as much dependence on having um, an open glottis throughout the maneuver.
So there is some evidence also for the COFID-CIS device, especially for ALS um, and muscular dystrophy. Some of the findings from these different studies have been they've been a bit variable, where in some cases, patients were able to attain a, a really good peak cough flow. For others, maybe their seal wasn't very good and they couldn't, um, but th the data is still um, quite weak. Pulmonary rehabilitation. Um, so I think there's been some excitement in the bronchiectasis community that perhaps bronchi uh, that pulmonary rehab might help get patients mobilized, recruit lung, improve their cough strength. To date, there is no data available to suggest that um, pulmonary rehab can accomplish this for patients. Though anecdotally, I have had patients find that it was helpful. So when you're thinking of prescribing an airway clearance regimen for someone, I think there are a couple uh, questions you should start with. So one, what is my patient's phenotype and what would the ideal airway clearance achieve for them? So for instance, I can think of a MAC patient of mine who has really severe pleuritic chest pain. She doesn't expect to rate sputum, but my hope was that through the use of a vest system and through huff cough maneuvers or active cyclic breathing, I should say, that this would help to reduce some of that pleurisy. And it in fact has. Um, I think another question to ask is what is my patient currently doing? What about that clearance modality is working and what isn't working? So I recently had a patient who has MAC who told me that religiously every day she will do her twice a day albuterol, 7% hypersal while wearing her vest. And while she's doing her hypersal, she feels her throat close. She starts gagging and coughing and can't really talk for 30 minutes afterwards. And, you know, that, that means that that modality is not achieving the outcome that we're, that doesn't get us to the goal that we want, which is just to help her get secretions up and out of her chest. And we found that switching her just to normal saline gave her that sense of softening and allowed her to do the airway clearance that we really wanted. Um, I think it's also important to account for socioeconomic and personal circumstances in your care plan. Um, I have a primary ciliary dyskinesia patient who's working 12 hour shifts doing construction and he has two small children and does not have the bandwidth to do two, two hours a day of religious nebulizing and wearing a vest. So our compromise was with that we found him a portable vest that he could walk around his house wearing once a day, just so that he could um, still keep up with being there for his family when he was home. Um, in some cases, some of the devices can also offer you feedback. Uh, say for instance, like your um, uh, the home IP v, v system and a number of vest systems have memory cards that can show you how frequently was it used and give you a sense of how well they might be responding based on your clinical assessment. And then finally, I always like to think of airway clearance really as a negotiation. Um, there's no value in setting unattainable goals. We should be setting patients up for success through sustainability. And so finally, my, my take home points is one that airway clearance is not just nebulizing medications. And in fact, it should really be focused more on mechanical modalities um, to help augment the strength of, and efficacy of someone's cough. Um, when you're prescribing, really consider what you want your airway clearance to achieve for the patient. Do they need to get better sleep? Do they need to... Um, do they need to break up biofilms? Do they need to fix their pleurisy? Do they just need to get more of these thick secretions up and out? Three, find a regimen that is sustainable. Perfection is the enemy of good. And in these patients, we want something that they can do every day for years rather than for short bursts of time. And then finally, and this is slightly an aside, um, you'll notice throughout our talk, we talked about patients with bronchiectasis. There's a growing feeling and sentiment throughout um, the bronchiectasis community, both physicians and patients, that the term non-CF bronchiectasis is in some ways almost derogatory or takes away from the suffering of a person with bronchiectasis who doesn't also carry the diagnosis of CF. 
and that we should be calling them patients who suffer from bronchiectasis. Um, anyway, thank you for your time. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Marmer. So at this time, we'd like to open it up for any questions. Feel free to uh, type your questions in in our chat uh, or raise your hand, and we'd be happy to, to call on you. I think maybe one item that might be helpful just to, to share with everyone. I think um, folks are very eager to get patients, things like a vest or an IPV system, and it can be challenging when you're trying to navigate the insurance and documentation component. Um, often what has worked for me and that I, I find to be very effective is to explain my patient has bronchiectasis as demonstrated on a CT image from whatever date. They've had a continuous cough for six or more months that has not responded to, say, a flutter valve or huff cough. And for this reason, I am prescribing X or Y um, mechanical device. And I find that to be very effective. So the first question uh, from uh, Sunita Mitka. Uh, Dr. Marmar, do you discourage use of nebulizers versus MDI? Um. No, I, I think whatever's most functional for the patient. In general, my feeling is that nebulizers offer better drug delivery and can also serve to soften and moisturize secretions throughout the airway. So I would say I'm probably more partial towards nebulizers, but if, you know, if a patient just doesn't have the time in their day with their work schedule and life demands to, to nebulize, which can take, you know, three mLs to nebulize can take you the better part of 20 plus minutes. Um, then if a meter dose inhaler helps them, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, looks like we also have a question from Matthew Dart uh, from UCLA. Thank you, Matthew. Um, and I believe the question is about active cycle of breathing techniques. So ACBT and AD should be taught to all patients who are capable. The UK and Australia are much better at utilizing these methods. Thank you for including them. Any additional comments? Yeah, absolutely. So actually, I would say that the um, NHS out of the UK has released a number of excellent YouTube videos where their, their respiratory therapy teams um, are demonstrating how to do active cycle of breathing and autogenic drainage. And I actually show patients on YouTube, see, look at all of these, maybe pick two videos and practice with the videos a few times. And that's really helped. Um, I've had a lot of uptake of those modalities in the last year. And then I see Sunita Metta. if we're just trying to soften secretions, would you suggest saline versus albuterol? Um, so I, I agree with your thinking that I, you know, by, by in principle, saline should help to break up secretions, soften them and allow them to be coughed out. I just wish we had better data to prove that that was true. Um, so, and, and right now we're in the midst of this huge um, shortage, worldwide shortage of saline where patients are really struggling to access it, where if they can get the same benefit from just nebulizing something like albuterol or normal saline, um, I would encourage you to use that instead so that we can sort of reserve the hyper solutions in the individual who really, really finds that that's the only agent that works for them. We have a question from Rigo Acevedo. Uh, do you know of any consolidated resources for learners to gain additional information about clearance devices? My primary resource is currently hassling my local respiratory therapists. Oh no. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I don't have a great answer to this question. I think, no, I, I don't, I don't. I wish I did, I apologize. And then is there a consensus on when to use inhaled corticosteroids in non-CF bronchiectasis? There is not, but I think you bring up a really important point that in, especially from more recent bronchiectasis research registry, research consortium data, we know that in the individual who strictly has a diagnosis of bronchiectasis, without concomitant severe COPD, with a smoking history, or without concomitant asthma, the use of inhaled corticosteroids can actually cause harm and increase their risk for infection. 
um, there is a small subset of individuals from that research consortium who showed benefit with the use of inhaled corticosteroid, but they consistently had a concomitant diagnosis of asthma. Oh, the bronchiectasis website from Australia is great too for anyone, for, uh, for everyone to know. Great. Thank you, Matthew, for sharing that. And then if insurance will cover cost, what is the cost for the portable vest? You know, I've heard very different numbers quoted to me by different patients, um, anywhere from a hundred dollar copay per month to completely out of pocket. It's very patient dependent and insurer dependent. Cause when do you initiate inhaled antibiotic regimens in bronchiectasis patients? This is a great and very controversial question. So I think we have really good data. We have good data in the NTM patient who has refractory disease, who are not clearing on, um, not clearing their cultures on oral therapy for MAC, where the use of Aricase can help them culture convert after six months. Um, and now we have ongoing clinical trials where Aricase could be used upfront in their treatment. But in terms of chronic maintenance therapy for bronchiectasis patients, there is really not any good data to support the use or to say that it's harmful to use nebulized antibiotics in someone who is, say, chronically colonized. For my own personal practice, if someone is colonized with pseudomonas, if, if someone first isolate pseudomonas, I do try to offer eradication therapy to almost all comers if that appeals to them. I explain that there is not good data behind eradication therapy, but that we can always try it to offer you relief. And I'll often do a combination of two weeks of Cipro and three months of nebulized tobramycin. For individuals who consistently isolate pseudomonas, I am open-minded in saying we can try a nebulized antibiotic, but we don't have data to support its use. And there is more recent evidence from the CF literature showing that there really is no benefit for using chronic nebulized antibiotics in chronic pseudomonas colonization. That said, I am told that there is going to be data coming out of the UK here in um, the next year or so um, talking about the use of continuous nebulized colistin, which apparently is very well tolerated in their patient cohort, um, and that had, has had a positive effect on reducing exacerbations, but let's see the study and see what it tells us. Are there any particular features um, of vests that you find important when prescribing vests to your patients? Um, I think the most important thing, if a patient is excited to use a vest, I, I think it's an individual who finds oscillation to be particularly helpful if they find that their secretions are especially sticky. Um, I also think in, in terms of which vest to choose, I would say um, bluntly, whichever one is covered and that they, that they can, that's going to be affordable for them. Um, but I think an important thing to think about is like for um, a patient anecdote I mentioned earlier, does the person need to be mobile? Are they able to sit down for 20, 30 minutes at a time or lay in a particular position to do their airway clearance? Or do they need the ability to be a little bit more mobile and moving around the house? Um, so I think those are some of the, the considerations I think about. Um, are steroids like Palmacort prescribed are on the rise along with mucomist and albuterol? Um, so I think now that we faced the shortage of three and 7% hypercell, we are seeing a number of additional prescriptions for things like mucomist and albuterol to serve as possible substitutes. We're finding now that the mucomist is also in shortage. Um, anecdotally, there's no evidence comparing these agents, but I have found that patients have sort of a partial response to class switching where somebody goes from 7%, maybe they try mucomist because it's in short, the 7% was in shortage and they may get a partial response, um, but it's 
it's inconsistent. But using something like Pomacort, remember, that's a steroid. And we do know that the use of steroids in someone with strictly a diagnosis of bronchiectasis can be associated with harm. I do not encourage the use of that agent unless you're specifically trying to treat something like asthma or airway hyperreactivity. Oh, what is my take on mucolytics? I, <laughs> I, I, they're my go-to, you know, I, I certainly, um, am open-minded about trying things like, uh, mucomist about trying things like hypersal 3%, 7%. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that for our patients who tend towards hemoptysis, using hypersal can often be, um, a strong irritant that causes pretty violent coughing fits where if someone easily tends towards hemoptysis, you can find that it's much more, uh, that the hypercell can be a bit more provocative of that hemoptysis. So just using it a little bit more um, judiciously in that group. Um, otherwise, I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, I think of my nebulized solutions almost secondary to the mechanical modalities that I'm, I try to promote up front. Thoughts on Atrovent or Duonep? Oh yeah, for patients who don't have COPD. Great question. Actually, I think about this a lot. Ipotropium, I have very mixed emotions about. So in theory, when you're giving Ipotropium or you know, a, a llama to your COPD patient, what you wanna do is try to reduce their secretion production. Um, in the bronchiectasis patient, I have some who say, I love epitropium. It really helps me and it helps me expectorate. But I have other patients where we've tried it and it has thickened their secretion to the point that it became actually harder um, and worked against our goal. So I, um, I, have very, I, I usually won't use it up front unless somebody really wants to try it um, or found that it really helped them in the past. Um, Oh, and then Maggie McElwain has a great paper on personalizing ACE that can help in the development of protocols and guidance. Excellent, great resource. Is there a place for Mucinex? I think there is a place for Mucinex because since we have no data to support our abundant use of nebulized solutions, as, as far as I'm concerned, Mucinex or Guaifenesin is a relatively harmless medication. I've had some patients tell me that when they tried it, their secretions felt so copious they couldn't manage them. But for some patients, it really makes the difference. So I, I think it's also on the table as adjunct to your mechanical and um, huff cough maneuvers. Thank you for the presentation. I have a question for you. Sure. <laughs> so you know, as you know, there's a lot of, um, well, there's, you know, several companies making sort of like a multi-function airway clearance device. For example, Hiram has just launched the Volera therapy, right? Can you comment on that a little bit? And, you know, just how, if you have, if you use it and what population would you use it in? Absolutely. So I do have patients who use um, a home IPV device that offers oscillation, PEP, and, um, moisture or nebulized solutions. Um, I find that that can be really helpful in, I've used it a lot in my patients with severe basilar disease. We're trying to really help recruit um, de-recruited regions of lung that are deeply plugged. Have It's been very effective for them. Um, and in individuals where the amount of airway clearance they need to do has become such an um, a time consuming regimen where offering them an opportunity to consolidate can be really, really helpful. Um, one challenge I have is that insurance companies often want you to pick one or the other. So if you want somebody who's been using one mechanism for years to just give this other one a shot, um, sometimes there can be a lapse in payment or coverage that can be challenging. Um, so something to keep in mind, but I think it has a role to play in individuals, both with bronchiectasis or neuromuscular disease. Um, and I think it can be helpful in folks who have variable levels of, uh, cognition from the totally independent individual to somebody who might be more dependent of care. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I also have a quick question for you, uh, hopefully, uh, 
any any thoughts or specific recommendations for post-surgical uh, or patients with pain, say rib fractures, who need mm. Yeah, so for my patients with, um, who have like had a traumatic fall um, and maybe had rib fractures, I, I have tried giving some of them positive expiratory pressure devices, PEP therapy or an oscillating PEP to see if that can just help them um, get through the acute pain stage. And I'll often really, really try to get them a lidocaine patch if there's superficial pain that we can try to control so that we don't impair their cough too much um, between opiates and pain. Great. Thank you. Awesome. Any final questions for Dr. Marmor? Really appreciate all of you uh, submitting them. And of course, for Dr. Marmor for answering all of them. You guys have been asking great questions. While all of you may be thinking of a last question for Dr. Marmor, I did want to say that uh, you can also meet Dr. Marmor on January 13th uh, at our California Thoracic Society Educational Conference. Uh, and Dr. Marmar will her expertise live with an in-person secretion management session. It's actually a hands-on okay. session, so you get some hands-on um, training and education on how to how to um, use airway clearance devices. Well, thank you guys for for having me and for spending your veteran holiday. For those of you who served, thank you for your service. Yeah. Again, thank you, Dr. Marmar. Uh, and My pleasure. Thank you all for participating and joining us this, this evening.